Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes, and today's guest is Mimi Bouchard. Mimi is a thought leader in the self-improvement and wellness space. She has helped thousands transform their lives through her actionable and pragmatic approach to personal development. Mimi's guided meditation platform, Superhuman, has amassed thousands of subscribers that swear by the practice daily. Her top 100 Apple podcast, Mimi, has almost 4 million unique downloads. So with that said, let's get this conversation going and welcome Mimi Bouchard to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Mimi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Doug. I'm super excited to be on. I'm excited to have you on too, because like after learning more about what you were doing, other than like superhuman app and everything that you're doing in the meditation space, I was super impressed and interested that you got into personal development super young. I mean, it's pretty uncommon, I would say, these days to get immersed in personal development stuff when you're in your teenage years with everything going on and how distracted people can be. So I guess like to get things started, like who were you? Like take us back. Like who was Mimi Bouchard without personal development? Oh my gosh, what a question. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I got into personal growth around 17, 18 years old. I read my first personal growth book then that my mom gave me. Um, and it really changed my whole world. But before then, uh, if we want to bring it right back from when I was born until I was around eight or nine years old, I feel like I was the authentic version of myself. I feel like I was a lot of who I am today. But from, I would say, around the age of 10 until 17, I really lost myself. And maybe it was going through puberty and, you know, just like learning about the world in a different way and seeing more of the realities of the world. I guess I was just very sensitive to energy, especially back then, and um, didn't really understand how to cope with down feelings. And I just lost myself. I didn't feel in tune with the authentic version of me. I felt very caught up in the wrong things. And I felt like, you know, being in the cool crowd and partying a lot and going out and doing drugs and just being a bad kid, I guess, was the way that I would get attention, you know, really bringing it back to that. And I, yeah, who was Mimi before she found personal development? She was very insecure, not confident, even though she projected a fake confidence to the world. You know, she didn't, like being alone. I, she felt very uncomfortable being alone and was just always distracted and didn't put any thought into her future, but she was really deeply ready for something to happen to trigger that change. It just didn't happen until she was 17, 18 years old. And then I had my little quarter life crisis and epiphany. And thankfully I had it all at a young age. I know it's very rare to discover this self-improvement work at such a young age. I was a baby. It was almost 10 years ago now. And I'm just so grateful that that happened because it changed the trajectory of my life. And I only really limited that those dark years to being, you know, early preteens to later teens. And thankfully I'm where I am today. I don't know where I would be without personal development, without diving into this work, without having that epiphany, probably be a darker path. And I'm just so grateful that the timing of my life happened the way it did. And now I'm committed to helping other people realize, you know, that they're is so much more to living and, you know, personal development and working on yourself and creating the life that you desire is inherently available to all of us. And yeah. It's impressive. And it seems like you've taken personal development and essentially like what the self-help space teaches you and just ran with it to an extreme, I guess, in the good way where you've now you know built a business, you've built a brand, you've rebuilt yourself from the inside out. I want to go back though. You you mentioned like between 10 and 17 was a very like dark place for you. You talked about maybe it was puberty or, you know, you were dealing with all these insecurities, like walk me through the best you can, like step-by-step, step. like how did this dark place start? And then between like 10 to 17, like what kind of things happened? Were there events where there are just things that maybe you did or something happened to you that, you know, allowed that dark time to get darker and darker through those years? It's a great question. Honestly, I don't even talk about this a lot and I don't even think about this a lot. So I'm actually going to have to think about this because I've kind of in a weird way, I don't want to say blocked it out because I'm not like storing trauma that I haven't dealt with, but I just don't think about it. And I just 
don't enjoy thinking about it, but of course I'm happy to share. I think the reason I started getting a little bit depressed and had started developing eating disorders and and deep depression and anxiety when I was so young, like 11, 12 years old was triggered by a, I would say society, you know, obviously you're so impressionable at that age and you're taught so many things growing up, like beliefs from your parents, from the world magazines. And I just never felt good enough at the core. I always felt like I I'll be happy when that was the mentality that I lived most of most of that time in, you know, I'll be happy when, and that when in my mind was when I look a certain way, when I'm skinny enough, when, you know, I can move out and make my own money because my parents didn't have a lot of money. I was very shameful about my family's situation, not having a lot of money. I was always very embarrassed. I had deep resentment and embarrassment and shame towards my family. And now I look back and, you know, I just, I know that they were doing the best they could with what they had. I was very sad and angry about that and comparing it to the people that I knew because I was around some people that had money and I was very shamed of that. And just deep down, it just created this inner hatred towards myself. And I also think the people that I was hanging around at that time had a massive influence on the darkness from that time in my life. There was this girl that I was friends with and she taught me how to make myself throw up. She taught me how to cut myself at 12 years old. She taught me how to do these terrible things. And she came from a very bad household. And it was just really that influence. I think I just took on and I just felt like I needed some sort of love and attention because my parents were working a lot. I have an older sister and, you know, we were very, very close growing up. And when I was 10, 11 years old, she was four years older than me. So she started getting boyfriends and having friends and her little sister was embarrassing and annoying. So I was just alone a lot. So I think it was just an accumulation of all these things. I will say I'm incredibly grateful looking back on my childhood. I never underwent any abuse. You know, my parents were always very loving, even though they did have a lot of fights about money and, you know, they have their own shit to deal with and they weren't perfect parents. They still did an incredible job, you know, raising us. And I think it it was just, it was a lot of, because of, of me and not, you know, knowing the things I know now. And then, you know, as I grew older, I, I started, you know, going out and partying a lot. I was in the kind of the wrong crowd of people. And in high school, I remember I would, you know, do any type of drug (laughs) that we were given, you know, buying quote MDMA off the side of the road and doing it at high school dances. And looking back, I really don't even think that was MDMA because I, I remember how messed up it felt. And like, I just didn't take care of myself. I didn't have value towards myself. I was really just crazy. And, you know, I just didn't respect myself whatsoever. And I just pushed away that authentic Mimi that I deeply was and that who I was for my, all my childhood. And I just went dark and, you know, my parents tried to send me to therapy. They couldn't even afford it. So there was so much guilt in the fact that they were forcing me to go because they had to pay like $80 per hour a week and they couldn't afford it. And it was like this big thing. And, you know, cause the teachers at my school were telling my parents that I was all messed up and I had to go to therapy. It was just like a very, very sad time because I just needed love and attention. And I don't say attention in a bad way. I think children need recognition. And I just was so alone and I didn't know how to deal with these big emotions. And, you know, in those teenage years, more things, you know, I could tell you so many stories of things that I just felt really down about that would happen. But ultimately I just, I had a massive epiphany when I was 17, 18 years old. And when I read this book, And the first personal development book that I read was The Success Principles by Jack Canfield. And my mom was getting into this work at the time. And she gave me one of the one of these books. And the first chapter of this book was You Are 100 percent Responsible for Your Life. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks. I really took what I read in that book seriously and I was ready to hear it. And everything changed after that. And it feels like it was just this overnight you know, radical change within me, but obviously it took a couple months and and a lot of breaking points to reach that. And I started even like, I was partying so much when I was younger, I started getting these like allergic reactions whenever I would smoke weed or like do cocaine or like do something crazy. I started getting these like allergic reactions. Like my eyes would shut from like inflammation. I have to go to like the doctors and like my body was just like not 
like it was done, you know, at that point. And I treated it like shit for too long. So I think I reached a breaking point when I read that book because it was after a big party binge and I just, I was over it. And it just, I decided I wanted to take control of my life. So to answer your question, you know, there were so many factors that I think if I could look back and dissect it all, those are the reasons. Right. So I guess, you know, if I can kind of reflect this back to you and correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, you were just at this age where you were pretty impressionable and you were kind of comparing yourself to others in, in society that along with maybe you weren't receiving the the right amount of attention from your family. You have a sister who is accomplishing some things that maybe you wanted to have, like you mentioned the boyfriend thing, right? Yeah. I don't think it was me wanting to accomplish that. It was more just me like being so alone. Like my best friend, my sister growing up, she started, you know, not wanting to be around me anymore and getting distracted. I was just very alone. And my parents were working so much because like they were trying to, you know, make money for the family. And it was a very stressful time for everyone. And I think now knowing that I am such an empath, I take energy on very easily. I was sometimes in an environment where no one was happy around me. And I just, didn't understand that that's not how life should be. And yeah, but it's so hard because I haven't thought about this in so long. I just like, there was something wrong and, you know, I didn't know how to fix it. I didn't have any really awesome mentors at the time either. I was just very lost and alone. And I was a child. Like, it's crazy to even talk about this because I was an actual child. And I guess, you know, it just really put me down this path to do what I do now. So it's obviously great to talk about, but it was, you know, it was a really tough time. Yeah. It seems like it. And I guess like just to go back to what I was saying. So it just again, like touched on like this perfect storm in your world at that time, talked about the things with your parents and stuff in society. And then obviously being alone with your sister, having a boyfriend, then you, you get introduced to, you know, some people that are making some bad decisions. And then you kind of, in a way, are looking for a community and to not be alone. So you start to hang out with those people and make bad decisions. And then as we know, these like bad habits and bad decisions can stack on top of each other. And then years go by and you're like, holy crap, like how the heck did I get to this place? And it all started with just slowly stacking these bad decisions. So you're 17, you're reading your first personal development book. You're having this epiphany. Like what transpired like the day before or that morning to make you say, you know what, I need to pick up this book and start reading it. and not just read it. Cause I know you said your mom handed it to you, but actually like take ownership of it and do it for yourself and not for your mom. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I wasn't doing it for my mom. I looked at like the back of the book and I read that this man that wrote it is like a multimillionaire and he has this life that he wants. And I was like, wow. Okay. Like I trust you because you're the one writing it. But what happened before is that I, I had just started my first year at university. So I was probably 18 and my first semester had passed. And that whole semester I was partying like a crazy person. And over the Christmas holiday, from what I remember, my mom gave me this book and I brought it back with me to my dorm room. And uh, I started, I decided I was just going to take a bit of a break from drinking and partying because I felt physically like terrible. And I was getting these weird reactions as well. And then, so I wanted to make some extra money as well on the side. So I started working at a juice bar in Halifax where I went to university for two semesters. And then I just kind of got clear minded because I stopped drinking for a few weeks and I was just drinking a lot of, you know, healthy juices and smoothies. And I was just kind of a bit like I was just cleansing a bit because I just I couldn't keep going. It didn't feel even good to party anymore at that point because I just felt terrible. And I, I guess it probably started from me wanting to lose weight and get skinnier. Like that was always a big thing for me growing up. I had like I mentioned, a lot of disordered eating. And it was always very hand in hand with my partying because I'd drink and go out and get totally fucked up. And then the next day I feel so hungover that I would eat loads and then feel gross and puppy. And then I just, you know, it was this awful cycle. So I guess it probably started as something probably a bit toxic, me wa wanting to work at this juice bar to get free healthy food and just like only eat very, very, very clean. And yeah, then I had this book my mom gave me over Christmas and she was just raving about it. I'm like, okay, you know, I, I was already ready for, to hear it. And for personal development, I was just starting to understand like who Tony Robbins was. Cause he was the big one at the time. Right. And who all these people were. And I was just like, wait a minute, this kind of feels like something I really am attracted to and drawn towards. And it was just a natural 
thing. It didn't, it wasn't a decision. It was just a natural magnetism towards this work from the point that I was at in my life. And I remember, you know, sitting in my dorm room, it was this tiny, like 150 square foot dorm room. And I just locked myself in there and, and bought a big journal and read this book and just wrote down as much as I could. And just to figure out my life, it was just like a total life audit. I was like, I can do anything right now. I'm so young. I can literally invent myself and I'm not going to leave this room until I do. So it was this like hunger that was suppressed inside of me for so long that was just starting to shine through. And the book really triggered it out of me. I started buying all these other books. I started writing a lot. I started just making decisions. I ended up dropping out of school and then moving to London, England a couple months later, like it was this whole thing. I was all in. I was, I had nothing to lose and I was so hungry for a different life. And another one of the principles that I read in that book that really changed me was you're an average of the five people that you surround yourself with most. I honestly remember reading that chapter. I was in like the cafeteria and I looked around myself and I was like, what am I doing here? (laughs) I don't want to be like any of these people. I want to be, I want to have a a big life. I don't like everyone I'm around all the time. It's just like, So every one of these very basic principles, you know, they just changed me and I was so young and so ready to hear it. And I just believed it all and went for it. So it was a big kind of black and white, crazy before and after. And I just, I had enough of it. Yeah. I feel like it's like the time where we make that decision to change is the time where life in itself of where we're at becomes much more challenging than the challenge of like making that change that we're scared of. Right. Like I think when so many people, they don't make that decision they want to make because they're afraid of like where that's going to lead. But when life like hits you and you have this moment where you're like, crap, like things are really bad right now. This is actually scarier than me making this decision to at least try this other thing that might make my life better in a way. And I know that your life has taken so many twists and turns over the years, like since that moment, you you mentioned you moved to London, you ended up on a reality TV show out there, right? Like tell this story, because I heard you tell this story on another podcast. And I think it's really fascinating on like how you were able to maneuver this to kind of get yourself on this TV show. Because I think there's a lot of lessons here. For sure. Well, so I moved to London and I got a two-year working holiday visa as a Canadian. You can do that. And I started just working, you know, four or five different jobs to make ends meet. I was, you know, at the time the pound was like double the Canadian dollar. And I had worked at a restaurant that previous summer before going, and I had some money in savings with my parents. I was totally self-sufficient since I left the house. So it was all me, this like 18 year old girl moving to London, not really knowing what the heck to do. I just, I knew that I wanted to have an online magazine, which was my business at the time that I was trying to make happen. You know, I coded the website myself, learned how to do that on YouTube. Like I was very self-sufficient and motivated. I had no money to, to spend on it. I had to do it all myself. So I moved to London, you know, got a roommate and found a really cheap rent and started just working all these odd jobs to make ends meet while trying to make my online magazine dream work. And I was doing things like dog walking, babysitting, interning at a styling agency, working at a juice bar. Again, another juice bar. I always liked working at juice bars because it was such expensive, healthy food. And I loved healthy food and I could eat it all for free. So that was my little hack. And yeah, I reached a point where my visa was expiring soon and I was starting to network a lot. And that's another principle in the book that I read. Your network is your net worth. And I started, I didn't know anyone when I moved to London. So when I was at the juice bar waiting for customers to come in, I would open up my Instagram and just DM loads of people that were in like the entertainment industry, the TV industry, fashion industry, just trying to like create this network. And I would probably message hundreds of people the same message and only one or two answered. And out of those one, uh, it was this girl and she invited me to an event and it was like a PR event. And I went there with her and I met my old agent. And my old agent and I were talking, and this is before she ever started representing me because I had nothing going on at the time. And I was telling her my dreams and I was telling her how I want to stay in London. My visa is expiring soon. And I was thinking, okay, maybe I could get into TV presenting because it's kind of maybe a bit aligned with my online magazine. And I like 
you know, the idea of that. And then she said to me, listen, there's this reality TV show called Made in Chelsea, and it's quite easy to get onto. And if you can get onto it, I'll start representing you and they'll give you a visa uh, to stay in the country. But she said, but you can't get into TV presenting because you're Canadian. They want a UK accent and it's really hard to establish yourself in that industry and they won't give you a visa. So do what I tell you and I'll start representing you. And I said, you know what? I never thought I would ever do that in my life, but I was, you know, 19 years old and very naive. And I was like, let's do it. So I got myself on the show and it was a very different experience to what I had, you know, thought it would be. This was so long ago. It's like hard to remember. I just remember being so naive, like naive was the word that I was <laughs> everything, but, and I just went on the show and they were like, do you want to be the strong female character? Like, you know, you want to do these things. And they kind of painted me as the bad guy for the first few seasons. And I kind of just did what they told me to. And I, I always say like, I used them as much as they used me. I needed a visa. It gave me a bit of a platform to start, you know, doing my own online magazine and blog and stuff. And, you know, I, I just used it. It never really was something I felt very aligned with, but it was definitely, it gave me the pedestal to do the next thing. And I am grateful for that. And it taught me so, so much. Um, I feel like I had aged five years within a year and learning how people manipulate in the industry. You know, it was a lot, it was very hard. And I was painted as the bad guy. And I had, you know, a very bad, like eating disordered eating issues at the time. And you know, there was even an episode where they had to bring me into the producer's office and get their like in-house therapist to like watch the episode with me before it went live. There was an episode where a girl called me really fat or something. And I wasn't even fat. I was like 15 pounds heavier than I am now. Like I was normal. And I was just so disordered at the time that like they had to like, you know, make sure the therapist was there with me and like that I was okay. And I was like, well, I don't want that going out on TV. That's humiliating. And they were like, no, it has to go out. And they weren't great. They weren't great. I'm okay saying that publicly. And, you know, I probably am not like allowed to say any of this publicly. But I don't really care anymore. <laughs> like they weren't great. And it was a lot of it was fake. Some of it was real, but most of it was fake and just exaggerated. And yeah, I just like, I used them as much as they used me. And I was on there for two years. So for four seasons and I just kind of did what they told me to. I just wanted the visa so badly. I kind of just, I was the perfect person for them because they could just tell me what to do. And I was desperate and they paid you terribly as well. So I was still like nannying at night <laughs> and while being on this big TV show during the day, like it was just a whole experience. But luckily, you know, I was able to start making my own money on the side when it came to my blog and my social media, my podcast that I started and that online magazine kind of slowly turned into other things. And um, years and years later, you know, I am very grateful that I'm where I am today. I don't live in London anymore. I live in the Bahamas with my boyfriend and I have a meditation app. And that's a very, very big jump from back then, you know, four or five, five years ago, I left the show. And, you know, it's just crazy how things evolve in your life. And in those five years, I've tried countless different business ventures that have failed. I have, you know, created it. I created a TV show that got sold to E and then like last minute it fell through from under my, you know, feet. And it just like, I've had so many crazy business experiences that have happened and that I've radically failed on. And then I move on to the next thing, but I really feel like this one right now with superhuman is what I meant to do for the, for the future time being. And I'm so grateful for how much I've been through in such a short period of time. I'm so grateful that I went through all that shit when I was younger. So I, I really realized that that was not something I wanted to go back to. And I'm so grateful for, you know, the people that I've been given in my life as well. You know, meeting my boyfriend five years ago when I was leaving the show really helped me. And, you know, it made me feel like I was lovable because I had never had a boyfriend before. And I had all these, you know, beliefs about myself that just weren't even true. And I'm grateful for realizing more about myself over the years. I'm not really this hyper sociable person that I thought I was. I'm a bit more introverted and I'm just so happy that I'm now able to take control of my own life. And I found something that brings me success and happiness. And I'm excited to see what happens next because I feel like finally I'm just taking a breath after my whole life of craziness. And I'm, I know that there's so much more excitement to come. So it, it feels like it's just up from here. Yeah, of course. It just it just seems like you've lived such a long life in such a short amount of time and learned so many lessons along the way and experienced so much 
you know, hardship, it seems like that has taught you a lot of valuable things personally and professionally. I want to back it up a little bit because I know that you had this epiphany within the personal development space and you that inspired you to kind of take action, take responsibility for your life, you move to London, get on this reality TV show. And you mentioned that that experience for you, like maybe wasn't what you initially thought it was. And it was just not a good experience for you. And you were in a darker, I guess, place than, than you were before you went on the show. Yeah, I like how you mentioned that because that that is a hole in the story here. So I got better. I read, started reading my books, got very motivated, was working really hard. Then I got on this show and then a lot of that kind of backtracked a bit. And I will say just for all the listeners, it's never a linear journey. So I've had ups and then downs and you go up a little bit more and then you fall down a freaking deep slope and then you go back up. Like it's not linear. So yes, I was on a high when I had left and moved to London. And then when I started the show and started getting taken advantage of essentially, you know, and just like letting them do whatever they wanted to me. And, and I didn't, I, all I cared about was staying in the country essentially. And yeah, I, I just lost myself a little bit there because I was doing something inauthentic and I started partying a lot again when I was with that crowd of people, because that's what they do. They party really hard and crazy. And I wanted to fit in. And I felt like I had to do what everyone else was doing. But then there was always, it's not like I went back down to where I was when I was 16. You know, I, there was a, suddenly a layer of, okay, like this is my set point, but like I can fall back down sometimes, but my set point was a bit higher. I wasn't as bad as I was when I was a kid, but you know, it was a different type of, of partying. It was, you know, like just, it was just different. And I was doing a lot of like cocaine and stuff. Like it was just like different. And I just like, didn't like how I felt. And it was just a lot of pressure. And with that, like, just, I was hanging with the wrong crowd and yeah, you know, like I just then slowly came out of it and I reached another breaking point a couple years after when I, when I was just about to leave the show and I was leaving the show because I actually met my boyfriend and the show is a lot about dating. It's like for everyone listening that doesn't know what it is, it's like kind of like the Hills, but in the UK. So it's a lot about dating and social life. And I met Ben and I didn't want our relationship to be ruined because it was the first special thing that's ever really happened to me. And I slowly just stopped feeding the producers any potential storylines. I started kind of taking a bit more of a stand on, you know, what I would film. And I just stopped being interesting to them on purpose. And they had just gotten me another visa for the upcoming year. And I had just started dating Ben. So I was like, I can't just like quit because then they'll take the visa away. So I just kind of slowly became less and less interesting. So they just naturally didn't want to film me as much. So I kind of just like took a step back in that way. But yeah, you know, then we started dating and I realized that being alone was another really important thing. I had moved into my own place at around that time as well. I didn't have any roommates anymore and I was spending a lot of time alone. And that's a really good thing. I think spending time alone is incredibly important for anyone that is going through something like that. And you just need to be explore yourself and who you are and, and really get to this comfortable feeling with yourself and not just be distracted all the time. So yeah, around that time was another kind of low moment. And then I kind of came out of it, you know, when I left the show. Right. Well, yeah. And of course, I think that in life, it's never linear, right? I think there's so many peaks and valleys. And the goal is like years later that you look back and you're like, oh, like, I'm a bit further up than where I was a few years ago. And then a few years later, you're like, I'm up a little bit further on the mountain. And oh, that dip taught me this lesson. And that dip taught me these lessons. And for you, like you mentioned, obviously, that like that moment you were experiencing in London with everything going on in the show, like it wasn't as dark as it was when you were a kid, but it was still like a time where you felt that you have you had fallen out of alignment a bit with who you truly were, and you were trying to to find your your way back to that. So I guess as we continue along your journey, you meet your boyfriend, Ben, you are slowly fizzling out of the show. What were some of the things that really helped you come back? to center with yourself and help you get back into alignment after coming to yet another epiphany at such a young age? Yeah. I think cutting out drinking and going out and partying is the number one thing. It's cutting it out. I cannot be clear-minded Mimi, the authentic Mimi when I am partying. And I have not, I can't remember the last time I got drunk. You know, I still like, so bless you. I still like socialize and, you know, do fun things now, but the drinking thing and the partying thing was out of control. And it 
it just took me so far away from who I really was. So that would be the number one step is stop drinking. And maybe, you know, if you want to do a glass of wine once in a while, dinner, I still do that sometimes, no big deal. But having that relationship with alcohol and drugs. Well, the drugs only ever came when I would be drunk. So just cutting that out. All the bad things always are tied to alcohol. You know, I would smoke cigarettes when I was drunk. Who am I? Like, <laughs> who, like who even smokes cigarettes? Like that wasn't in the Jack, that wasn't in the Jack Canfield book. No, <laughs> I'm no, kidding, I'm no. joking. <laughs> it wasn't. I'm joking. I was just like a bad like. I just didn't care. And for a long time, I would just like get this craving to smoke cigarettes when I'd even have like a glass of wine. And then I just like slowly as I stopped, you know, doing that, I just went away. But I was like, I had like, I'm not an addictive personality person, I don't think. But like when I would drink, I had these addictive tendencies come out, whether that's with drugs or with smoking or whatever. So yeah, to answer your question, cutting that out was the biggest one. I would say just reflecting and looking back, hanging out with different people, because even before drinking, if you're hanging out with the people that pressure you to do these things, you're going to be more likely to do them. So just hanging out with different people and not the bad crowd that doesn't actually, you know, care about you. They just want a fun person to party with. You know, I had a lot of those friends that didn't actually care about me that just wanted a fun time. And Mimi, when she was drunk, was a fun time. So they just wanted to hang around for that reason. And really getting clear helped me. I started journaling a lot. This is when I started implementing a morning routine where I would journal and just like feel like I would set the day up for success. I started just taking care of myself a bit more. And I will say like, it just happens gradually. I healed myself from an eating disorder. I healed my depression and anxiety. I have created the life of my dreams. And I will say the main thing that helped me get to all of those, I, it wasn't therapy. I didn't do therapy since I was 12 years old. I, you know, for that one time that didn't even, it didn't even work for me at the time. Like it wasn't therapy. It wasn't anything crazy that I can sell you. It was simply changing my self image to match the person that I wanted to be. That was like the fundamental part of all of this. And that's now what I teach. So everything that I transformed was to do with me changing my self image first. And how did I change my self image? I, you know, was writing loads. I was getting very, very clear on who I wanted to be, who my future self was, what I wanted, the goals that I had in my life, the vision I had for my future. And then I started just trying to practice being that person more and more and changing my energy to become aligned with that version of me that ultimately at some point I slowly became her. And it sounds very simple and that's because it is, but the hard part is actually getting to that point of your self image changing. Transformation is so easy. Once your self image has changed, transformation is effortless. Once your self image has changed, but when you're still stuck in the old self image, it is so hard to change because you're doing it from an old self image perspective. Just like, for example, if you offered me a cigarette right now, I would say, no, I'm not a smoker. But if I was Mimi at 20 years old, drunk, I'd be like, okay, yeah. You know, like, cause it, back then my self image was someone that did that when they were drinking. Some of that even drank a lot in the first place. And now I just like, it's just an instant, easy no, because it just wasn't who I was. Same thing with, you know, binging and purging. Like if I ate too much tonight, I'd be like, okay, I'm just going to like sleep it off. Cause I, it doesn't even cross my mind. I'm not someone that has an eating disorder. It doesn't happen. I'm also not one to, I'm not, I don't overeat. So I don't even get to myself in that place. And the first, you know, it's just, I'm not the kind of person that enjoys feeling overly full. It's just not who I am. Cause it feels like gross, you know? And back then I was just, I would hate people like me now. I'd be like, oh, like, how do you not think about food all day long? It was a control thing with me back then. I would constantly be thinking about it. So, you know, just to all bring it back to the point here, it's all about the self image and what truly actually helped me change is changing my self image. And there's so many things you can do to change that. I agree because I think that if we don't, create our own identity or self image, we will slowly, you know, use other people's identities and their images to create an identity for ourselves. We end up becoming like a chameleon, right? Where we're so far removed from the original version of ourselves because we want to, you know, find community, be like other people so bad that we'll do anything and everything 
to do that. And one of those things that often happens is sacrificing our own values and our own identity. And then it gets so bad that we end up filling ourselves up with the values and identities of, of other people. And obviously I know that you know therapy wasn't your bag. I mean, I think that, you know, I just want to clarify, I think if the listeners, if I always recommend therapy, if it works for you, and if, if somebody wants to try it and it's aligned with where they're at in their life, I, I highly recommend it. One of the things I wanted to ask you is you seem like somebody who's hyper self-aware and super self-disciplined and has gotten to know yourself very well. Have you ever found yourself thinking that like a lot of what you've done over the years, whether it be the partying when you were a kid and then becoming like hyper obsessed with self-development, the reality TV, like all this stuff was a way to like escape something from like your past that you maybe like, you know, haven't had an opportunity to go and deal with. That's an awesome question. And before I answer it, I will say, you know, I totally agree with you on the therapy thing. It just, what didn't work for me at the time, I wasn't ready for it. I recently actually just uh, had a new kind of coach therapist. Like I, over the years recently, I have had that. So it definitely is helpful. But at the time, it just, I, at the end of the day, you can't help anyone that doesn't want to help themselves. So that was kind of what I was getting to there. But yeah, I don't think I was trying to block something. I think I was just lost and I had no other direction to go. And I felt like feeling happiness and importance and feeling like I had positive attention on me would come from these negative things. And it just didn't. Um, I'm very lucky that I didn't have anything traumatic happen in my, in my childhood. I, I really didn't. And that just shows that you can get so effed up without even having that. And then I'm sure 10 times more, if you have that, you know, I feel so much compassion for people that actually had something terribly go wrong in their childhood. And I don't have that. And, you know, I, I think it's possible for everyone though, to create the life that they want, no matter what happened in their past. And um, I think also each person is so individual. Each child is so individual that if you have a siblings, you know, one sibling could end up very different to the other when it comes to mental health and they had like the same upbringing. Right. So I really don't know if it all just depends on, on actual traumatic situations. It has a lot to do with the person and how they react to their environment, I think as well. And you know, what they consume and see. So yeah, in my mind, and I've done a lot of work on myself I haven't come up with one thing that I had previously tried to like block by doing all of those, those bad things, you know? Right. Yeah. Cause I mean, I appreciate you sharing that and and being vulnerable and then honest with what you said. The reason I ask is because I think a lot of times what happens is people have these massive transformations and these aha moments and they go, they get into health and fitness, they get into personal development, they get into meditation, they get into a relationship, something that like kind of takes them away from some of the pain that they might have been going through or stuff that, you know, really messed up their lives that they oftentimes some like forget about it. You know what I mean? And they get so involved in this other stuff that they don't deal with some of that stuff. And that stuff slowly will creep up and impact their relationships just a little bit, their work just a little bit, their health just a little bit. And it slowly builds over time. And then like a decade might go by and now it's impacting it like a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then something happens when you're like, why am I feeling this way? Like I have success. I have my health and fitness. I'm in a great marriage. I love my job. Like, why is this happening? And then a lot of it, I think is just, you know, toxic patterns, like unhealthy coping mechanisms, behaviors, mindsets that people have just adopted throughout their lives that they just haven't, you know, taken the time to unpack and unlearn. Yeah. It's the lack of direction. A lot of it, you know, and as you speak, I'm just thinking how true it is that everyone's healing journey is different. You know, what I did in my life and how I got out of where I was could have not worked for someone. Like I just really did it alone. And I know a lot of people need a lot more handholding. I don't think I was fully alone because I would just, you know, read books all day and, and watch videos all day from mentors that didn't even know that I existed. You know, I, I felt like I was consuming a lot of the right things and that's what also helped me. But I will say everyone's healing journey looks different and we have no idea, you know, even based on someone's past, like what actually is going on inside of them. I think that I just had a revelation and this weird unhuman wisdom came over me when I was going through this work. And it was just like something that I deeply knew. I was very in tune at that time. And I decided 
that this was something I had to do. And that's how it felt to me. But for someone else, it could feel different. For someone else, it could be another human really helping them one person in person. So I can't, I don't have the answer. Like I wish it was just like the most simple cookie cutter thing, healing for everyone, but it's so different. And as I share my story, you know, it's just what happened to me. And I think everyone can write their own story in that sense too. I do believe that we are all responsible for our lives. That's one of the principles that changed my life as someone that acted like a victim all the time. It's something that really deeply helped me. And it also helped me massively with my career and work and wealth and relationships and personal relationship with myself. So that's something that I just urge everyone to adopt and not fight because so many people want to fight that, that principle. And listen, I do too sometimes, but just that deep belief that I'm in control of my life is so freaking empowering and it changed my life. Right. And you're right. Like nobody's journey is the same, right? Like healing is different for everybody. Success is different for everybody. You know, the way that people succeed personally and professionally is going to look different depending on who you are. But obviously you've had a lot of success. You've had a lot of failures personally and professionally, and you've learned a lot. You have so much wisdom and it just seems like you are so self-aware and self-aware to the point where you know exactly like where you're going, you know exactly what works in your life, what doesn't work, you know, when something's off, what needs to be done, how to fix it and how to improve yourself as a person. And I think there's a lot of like younger people now that are just struggling, not just with direction. They are struggling. They're like living in their parents' houses until they're like 30 years old. They are comparing themselves to people their age when they're in their twenties and they're getting out of high school. They are like letting their parents in a way, like dictate how they're going to live their lives. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't listen to their parents. It's like, what I'm saying is their, their parents are telling them they need to go this way to be successful. And the kid wants to go that way. And they have no idea like what to do because what's in their heart and what their parents are, are telling them it's can be confusing at times. What kind of things would you tell somebody? I mean, I know there's obviously not a recipe for success, so to speak, for every single person, but like what were some of the like things that you've learned in your life that if there were like three to five things that are relatable to anybody who's listening to this, whether it's a kid, whether it's a parent who wants to pass this episode along to their, their kid to make sure that they set themselves up for success? That's such a good question. I recently hosted a 25 woman retreat in Arizona and one of the main, it was called the ultimate life retreat, how to live your ultimate life. It was a six day thing. And I shared at this retreat, my theory for this, and it's two words, clarity and becoming. So clarity is very easy. First, you need to know what you want. You need to understand where you want to go to get there. You can't just aimlessly move through your life. You need to have clarity. So whoever is listening right now, if you get clarity and your clarity can change, you can change your mind. It's okay to change your mind. I changed my mind many times. So just get initial clarity and make sure it comes from your heart. And it's not for, you know, impressing society with a new car or this or that, like make sure it's something that truly comes from you. So get clarity on what you want and then become the version of you that has that become the kind of person who has that and start making the decisions that that person does your future self. That's now your future self archetype. The person that has what you want, start moving like them, start speaking like them, start believing like them, start thinking like them, start, you know, having your mannerisms like them. You know, you literally need to become the kind of person that has what you want to get what you want. And it makes it effortless. And, and I also will say another piece of advice, if someone is telling you what to do with your life, I only take advice from people that have what I want. That's a big principle of mine that some people, again, don't agree with, but it's something I have found very, very helpful in my life. Why would I take relationship advice from someone who is, you know, divorced three times and has never had a successful marriage? You know, I would, I would take relationship advice from my mom and dad because they've been together for 35 years, but I would not take financial advice from them, bless them. I would take that from someone in my life that has what I want financially or has the business that I aspire to have that certain level. You know, I really believe in that. So if someone else is telling you where to go and what to do, like, do they have what you want? If so, definitely consider their advice. But if they've never experienced what you want, 
not, they're not qualified to tell you how to get there. So that's another piece of advice I would say. And if you're young, you don't have that much to lose at the beginning. I use that to my advantage. I also think though, even if you're listening to this and you're 50 years old, you know, you still have hopefully another 50 years of life. So why not just start now too? You know, I really don't, I don't think about age a lot. I really don't. If I was, you know, 50 years older now, I would still be doing what I'm doing. I really just don't take that into consideration that much, to be honest, but that's what I would say. Clarity and becoming. Right. Clarity and becoming. I love that. And I would say that it's not very common these days for somebody to have as much as much success as you've had at your age. And not only, I don't, I don't mean success like financially, I mean like the self-awareness, the discipline, maturity, like everything you've gone through at your age. I mean, I, th- I think it's very rare for that to happen. And, and the reason I say that is obviously, you know, getting clarity and focusing on becoming the version of yourself that you want to be is super important. I, I understand that. But I think that in order for those two things to happen, there has to be this innate level of focus and discipline to accomplish those two things. And we live in a world now where kids are so distracted with social media, with the internet, with just their attention spans, just just shrinking just by nature of how the world's changed. And obviously you are somebody who has you know accomplished a lot of self-discipline and gotten to a place where you have a great level of focus. How do you think, like knowing what you know about, you know, teenagers knowing that you just, you weren't, you know, you were one not that long ago. Like what is your advice for kids to develop and stay focused in a world where they're so easily distracted? Absolutely. And I will argue though, that this um, distraction thing actually falls under the becoming section, because if you're acting like the person you want to be, they're not on social media all day long. They actually turn off their phone when they need to focus. So, cause I've struggled with the same thing and, you know, I'm 26 years old, so I'm still definitely very young and I can remember what it was like being younger, especially with technology and social media. So my, my biggest tip for anyone listening that struggles with that is you have to just, there's no secret sauce, delete the Instagram app, the TikTok app. Like if your business is not online, I go through even we in my I have a social media presence. I delete Instagram and TikTok for weeks at a time sometimes. And there is this dopamine addiction that we all have and it numbs us out. And one of the biggest things that holds us back in life is numbing out. So whether that's too much TV, too much social media, too much drinking, too overeating, you know, too much of anything is not good for you. And that numbing feeling is what holds us back. And my life's work is to help people feel more alive, which is the opposite of numbing. So the more you feel alive and the less numb you feel, the better. So, you know, you just have to want it badly enough. And if you're spending hours on social media every day, there's obviously something that that you want to numb out from and whether that's a lack of clarity, which it usually is for me when I find myself veering towards numbing, it's because I feel like I don't know what else to do and I feel a lack of clarity or overwhelm. So just notice those patterns within yourself and just forcefully delete the app off your phone. Like, I wish I could say it in a nicer way, but like you literally just have to do it and take control of your life because your phone is so addictive. It's so addictive and so many mental health problems actually stem from too much technology. And if you're feeling low or depressed or not clear or not like yourself, just get off social media for a bit. Just do it for a week. You'll feel the difference. Yeah. I love that advice. And you're right. Focus on like becoming that version of yourself that you want to be. And if you're somebody who wants to be successful, you want to be, you know, you want to have great mental health, you want to have prosperity, you want to be purpose driven. Like a lot of times those people like aren't glued to their phones all day. So that's definitely like a good step in order to gain focus is to really set boundaries with your phone. I have two more things that I want to ask you. The first thing is that you're somebody, you're young, like you said, you're 26. You've had a lot of ups and downs and you've had some some failures like professionally. And I think people in general, they get attached to, to outcomes. They get attached to the failures and they end up having something not work out. And they assume that that is going to be the way it is for the rest of their lives. How did you learn to have a healthy relationship with failure so that you could see it as a stepping stone and not necessarily as your final destination? I think that I learned early on that success doesn't come without failure and that every, I train my brain to start thinking like every failure that I experienced meant that I was one step closer to success. 
because no success happens without failure. And the more failures that you experience, I believe the closer you are to success because with every failure you learn and you change as a person, you get wisdom, you know, all the failures that I had, I'm so grateful. I learned so much about business and all these business failures, especially that now with superhuman, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm doing it right this time. And of course, I think I'll fail in other ways as, as well. And there'll be things that I hadn't learned yet because there's always something you hadn't learned yet. And then I'll pivot and I'll continue going. But, you know, I think starting to just position it differently, failure is not failure. Giving up is failure. Failure just means next or reassess or evolve more and then move on. And it strengthens you. It builds character. I actually am not scared of the word failure. I am not, you know, opposed to it. I actually invite it. And I know deep down that my identity and my self-image and the person that I am is someone that will always have success in their life. And if they have failure, they're just going to figure out how to get that success again, because it's just who I am. Like, you know, those stories of multimillionaires or billionaires that just like lose all their money in a crazy deal. And then they like, just make it all back up again. You know, like, it's just like, they're just the type of person that has like an internal set point, a standard of a certain level of success. And I, they just like, aren't even worried when they lose a lot of them, not, not all of them, but a lot of them are just like unfazed and they're just like, okay, I'll make it back up again. I kind of feel like I'm the same now where it's just like, it's just who I am. It's part of my essence. And I've had to train myself very hard and rewire my brain to get to that point. But I'm there now and I feel like it's just going to continue to expand. And, you know, failure is not something I'm scared of to, to bring it back to that. Right. And I think that one of the biggest things that I got from that is the importance of acceptance. Because I think what really screws a lot of people up is that they just think that something's automatically going to work out to a T the way that they envision it to and they get attached to the outcome. And they feel that if it doesn't work out, like that's a reflection of who they are personally, right? And it's like, if they fail, then that means that they're not going to be successful at anything. And that means that they're like a terrible person, terrible business person. And I think acceptance is so important because when you accept it, you know, failing and learning and having things not always go perfectly as part of the process, you understand that it's a lot of good things. Like there's a lot of good that comes from it because it's part of the process. It makes you a better version of yourself and improves how you operate your business. It allows you to make more money, hopefully produce more meaningful content on, online, like whatever it is, instead of like the other side of that is if you don't accept it, you're just going to fall into this victim shame cycle and say, woe is me. I can't believe this didn't work out. I'm never going to amount to nothing. I'm never going to try again. And then you end up, like you said, quitting. And that is like failure, is taking yourself out of the game, disqualifying yourself automatically because you gave up on yourself and you didn't want to stay in the game and, and try and play till the end. And I think what you said is, is so important. I think a lot of people hopefully are going to, to resonate with that. As we kind of bring everything to a close, and I've really enjoyed talking to you and, and having this open dialogue about your journey and about all your life lessons and your successes personally and professionally. I want to dive in a little bit to superhuman because I know that's what you're working on now. That's something that you're super passionate about. And it's this unique meditation app where I think it's from what I see, it's much different than traditional meditation. So talk about superhuman, why you think so many people like it and what's most exciting about it for you. Yeah, thank you. And you know, superhuman is something that didn't exist until I created it because there was a need for it. Back when I first started my personal development journey, I kept hearing about the benefits of meditation and visualization and using, you know, visualization to create more of what you desire, you know, to help reprogram your mind and, oh, these amazing benefits. <laughs> um, and then I just hated it. I, I downloaded all the apps. I really tried. I couldn't get into it. I kept saying, I'm not the kind of person that can meditate because my brain works too quickly. I just like, can't sit down and focus. I'm just wasting money on these apps. And then I started recording on the voice memos on my phone back four or five years ago. I started recording these pep talks to myself. Like I would just record like a 15 minute recording of just me talking to myself, um, saying, okay, Mimi, like, this is what your life is going to look like in a few years. If you just focus, like this is your future self. She is this, she is that. She is graceful. She is loving. She's successful. 
whatever my self image that I wanted was at the time. And I would listen to these voice memos all the time while I was doing other things. So I would be listening to them and visualizing while I was walking to the gym in the morning, while I was making breakfast, while I was getting ready to go out for dinner. I would just listen to it all the time and it helped me program my mind in a very effective way. And I started to realize the more research I did, the reason it was so effective is because it was priming my mind while I was doing these everyday activities. So it's like the Pavlov dog theory, you know, he rings the bell and the dog is salivates, I was kind of doing the same thing with programming my mind. So every time I would walk to the gym in the morning, I started, you know, when I was listening to these things, I started doing it so much that I just started feeling different and associating these new emotions and this new energy to these everyday activities. And long story short, you know, years later, I launched a subscription platform all about health and wellness to my audience. And it was recipes and workouts. And I was just kind of testing a different business model. And just to add some value right at the bottom, I started recording these kind of meditations, I would call them because I didn't really know what to call them. I just wanted to meet the customer where they were. So I started recording these like more visualization focused meditations that you can listen to at any time of the day, right at the bottom of this subscription platform. They became the most popular thing on the platform and I quickly pivoted and I changed the whole brand and I hired a big marketing agency to help me, you know, change everything up around. And I really saw the globalization potential with this product because it's just like everyone was obsessed with it. So then I relaunched as Superhuman 13 months ago. And since then, it's been absolutely crazy. We've had tens and tens of thousands of people on the app, you know, trying these new unconventional meditations, you know, walking meditations, cooking meditations, cleaning meditations, getting ready in the morning meditations. And I I integrated in really incredible music. So it's very different from a music perspective, from a word perspective, and from an action perspective. So our music, our audio engineers are amazing. They create really uplifting. It's not traditional meditation music. It's feel good movie moment, main character energy type of movie, like movie soundtrack type of music with very epic, inspiring words, help you visualize. And these specifically help you change your self image to what you desire. This is exactly what I was looking for back in the day. And ever since I've actually become a very, very consistent user of these meditations, my life has changed so much more and so much faster, you know, over the past seven, eight years of this personal development journey, I've noticed when things move fast and when things move slow and they move really fast when I'm doing this work, when I'm integrating this work into everyday moments. Um, And it's fun to do, you know, superhuman doesn't require you to change a behavior. Like we do have seated meditations if you want to sit down and meditate for five minutes in the morning. But if you aren't used to that, you can just listen to it while you're walking, while you're cooking, while you're working out, you know, they're literally designed for everything. And we have 16 plus plus categories now of meditations and we're continuing to add. So yeah, all in all, superhuman is incredibly different to anything else out there. I really think that we're creating a new category of sound and I like to call it functional audio, but I'm going to come up with a better word for it soon. In the next year or two, I actually want to phase out the word meditation from the product. So it just becomes its own realm of sound. It's really so much more than the word meditation. And, you know, it's so untraditional that I just don't, you know, I just don't feel like it resonates. So we're starting to kind of figure that out and yeah, and and now start to look into more marketing initiatives. The whole growth over the past 13 months has been all word of mouth organic. And it's kind of wild how quickly a company can grow just by word of mouth. And we've really just like been growing faster than we can handle. So I'm now on a hiring spree. You know, we are just launching a new version of the app in five weeks with a whole new team of developers. I didn't realize we'd be able to afford, you know, an amazing team of California based developers only a year into the app. And, you know, we license like the current version of the app that is probably, well, we're launching mid November, the new app. So if you're listening to this after mid November, it's the new app, but the current version I'm licensing from like a random app development company in like Romania, like I'm licensing the code. I don't even own it because I couldn't afford it (laughs) a year and a half ago. I, you know, it's, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a custom app. And we're now finally at the point where like, okay, let's do it. And we're launching it in five weeks. So it's again, like not a linear journey. Like I building an app is 
extremely expensive. I had to figure out a loophole. I figured out a way I negotiated a crazy deal with a random dev agency to make a custom app for me and just license it, license it to me instead of paying an upfront cost. So we're definitely moving fast and everything's changing. And, you know, more than ever, I'm just so grateful for everyone that just like believes in the product as much as I do. It's changing lives right, left and center. And it's really crazy how this word of mouth, this organic snowball effect of growth has just occurred because it's more than I could ever imagine. But then yet again, I'm not even shocked, Doug, because I'm a product of my work. I'm literally the poster child of how the self-image work and through this unique approach to visualization and guided meditation, you know, can affect your life. Like I am, I've manifested all of this. <laughs> like it's crazy. So, you know, just to kind of bring it down to that, like, your whole life for all the listeners right now, like your whole life can change in a year. Your whole life can change in six months. Like it really just depends on how you, how much you align with the version of you that has what you want. And superhuman honestly is the best way that I've found helps me get there to the next level, helps other people get there. And that's why I had to create it because it hadn't existed yet. I love like purpose that gets created from pain, right? Like I love mission driven businesses that get created from moments of pain. And I love how you've dove into this niche of, like you said, you don't really want to call it meditation anymore, but for now it's called it meditation that didn't really exist because so many people, like even myself, like have a hard time, like sitting still and listening to different sounds and like, you know, remaining calm and collecting their thoughts and just being present without something external, right? Like so many people struggle with that. And sometimes you got to meet people, you know, where they're at. And also on top of that, you got to you know, have something else that might work for those people where the sitting still meditation doesn't work for them. Right. So I love how you've, you've gone deep in this niche and it's inspiring. And I'm proud of you for taking that. And you should be proud of yourself for how much success it's had so far. And I will make sure to plug the links to it in the show notes, as well as for people to connect with you, because Mimi, this has been awesome. I think you know people are going to get a lot of value out of this conversation. You have so much wisdom and you've overcome so much. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that Mimi said about her childhood and what she went through and how that led to her you know, first big epiphany. Maybe it was something that she said about moving to London, going on reality TV and how that led her to another dark place. Or maybe it was something that she said about how she transformed herself and took those moments to you know, really, really do a lot of deep work on herself internally and create the life that she wanted and what she's been able to do with that to create things like Superhuman and everything else that she's done professionally. Whatever the takeaway was, tag me, me and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. I mean, once again, thank you for listening to this episode of The Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. We'll see you next time.